Yeah. So I think I'm looking for um, tools, specific tools. Like you said, you can't just use like a num number of three specific questions uh, to answer. Mm. We need to be equipped, and that is coming obviously with the uh, recovering of the Christian mind. But at the same time, you still have to have kind of a guideline to go by because of these very threats that we're facing. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, the reality of the situation is that um, a faithful Christian confession is going to start costing us something again. I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next session. Um, but I work with an organization, well, actually, I work with a number of organizations around the world with them. Um, ADF in, in America and with Christian Concern in the UK. Christian Concern has a Christian legal center and they are dealing with dozens and dozens and dozens of court cases every single year of Christians losing their jobs, uh, um, uh, basically being fired, being silenced, being suspended and so on for what we would consider unbelievable things. For example, a doctor was just struck off in the UK, a Christian doctor, for refusing to call a six-foot-two bearded man a woman. And at his tribunal, at the, when his case was heard, the tribunal actually said, and this made the National Compost in, um, the, I mean, the National Post in, um, in the US, um, They actually said that when his appeal was the fact that he's a Christian and the, and the word of God says God made the male and female and that this was the foundation of an understanding of um, human identity in the West. The tribunal said that um, the Bible um, was an assault on human rights. Um, and so that, that kind of thing there's a, there's a professional cost right away there for that doctor. Now, he was willing to pay it, and he's t he, this is going to go, this is being appealed. Um, the CMDS here um, have, have been in the courts over the conscience rights of doctors, right, to not have to refer people for death. So there is, there is going to now be, it's going to sort out, as we say, the men from the boys. There is going to be a sifting in the life of the church as to who is actually ready to stand for Christ and who is going to... You see, Ed, Edmund Burke, the great English parliamentarian, contemporary of William Wilberforce, is reputed to have said, all that it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And if we don't speak out and articulate a Christian view and defend a Christian view, we will soon lose all our rights to speak it. Uh, the big threat that lawyers are talking about now and this came out, if any of you are watching any of the Democratic um, debates in the US, the Democratic Party, that sort of conga line of interesting individuals, um, they were basically saying in their primaries there that um, Christian organizations and institutions, including churches, that do not bow to the inclusive LGBTQ agenda will lose their charitable status. Now, that is a very, very real possibility here in Canada. has been for a number of years. Some of you may be aware of the summer jobs uh, uh, fiasco where Justin Trudeau introduced a, basically a, a heresy test for getting government grants for students for summer jobs and organizations which didn't uh, fall in. Um, and I was meeting with some heads of universities here in Ontario, Christian universities just in Ontario recently, uh, saying that even again this year, bureaucrats went on their website. This is a chartered university said, no, you can't have the grants. We don't like your website. We don't like the things that are on it. Now, that is a, that's a, that's a heresy court. That's, a, that is a, that's an orthodoxy test by the state for taxpayers. So there is a big question. I mean, I have, when I'm speaking in Canada now, I have e mainline evangelical churches afraid of my coming to their church because they are nervous that somebody says something or report something or the press get hold of one of my titles or whatever, that, that, that there could be intimidation, threats, charitable status issues, and so on. That's going to become more and more the case. And so the question will become, do we want to be a confessing church or do we want to be a Reich church? That will be the choice for the church going forward. 
So this is, a, this is a serious time for the life of the church. That's why a, a root and branch reformation in the, life, in, the, in the life of the church in terms of a Christian mind is needed. That's why the Ezra Institute is devoting its time and resources and energy to young people. Our high school programs and then our professional and student programs. Because they have to get firm, they have to understand all of this and get rooted and grounded in a Christian mind because it will cost them something. See, we've had the luxury we're sort of 60 plus today. We've had the luxury of, you know, the cottage in Muskoka and the speedboat and, you know, our comfortable local church and so on, and golf. We've had that luxury. My children aren't going to have that luxury. They're not. It, they're, it's going to cost them something. And we have, to be, we have to prepare them for the potential cost of that. If the, if, if the current trajectory continues... now. By the grace of God, if the church wakes up, there's still a lot of us. Now, if the church actually spoke with a consistent voice, imagine that. If the churches, the evangelical churches, even across this, what are they going to do? Throw us all in prison? I don't think so. But it's isolated individuals, you see, that get picked off. A little Christian school here out in the boonies in the middle of nowhere that gets a human rights case or whatever. Different individuals get picked off. The church doesn't speak boldly with clarity and one voice into these issues. And that's what's going to be needed. And as we're faithful, even with our own children, we can, I believe we can turn the tide, but it's going to take sacrifice and it's going to cost us something. 